Asian markets start on the back foot in the absence of cues from Wall Street. The gift nifty is also indicating a lower start for the Indian market. Crude prices slip, Brent corrects to around $78 a barrel, even as investors remain wary of supply disruptions due to the conflicts in West Asia. Gold too gains on safe haven buying. In key earnings to track today, HDFC Bank expected to report a stable quarter with net interest income rising around 6%, according to a CNBC TV18 poll. From the broader market, watch out for numbers from Federal Bank and LNT Tech Services. And noted economist Kenneth Rogoff flags higher odds of a recession in the United States and says that 2024 will not be as good as 2023. He also believes that interest rates will remain higher for longer. On India, he is cautiously optimistic as he believes there is a need to address some long-term problems. In some more commentary from Davos, Axis Bank's Amitabh Chaudhary says credit growth will have to slow down as deposit growth reduces. M&M's Anisha sets down ambitious growth targets for the company, targeting 5x growth over the next five years. Good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast. I'm Pavitra Parekh. Those are the top headlines that we have for you on this Tuesday morning. There's lots to track, but you know, as far as the global markets go, uh, it's, there's not been too, uh, too much action. Of course, you know, the US markets were shut on account of Martin Luther King holiday. So we don't have cues from there, but Asia is largely starting lower at the start uh, right now. So what's suffering the biggest loss is the Japanese markets. That's down around 200 points on the Nikkei. You have Hang Seng and Taiwan up on your screen. Both of those also seeing losses right now. So the Taiwanese index is down over 1%, 1.2% right now on that one. Hang Seng is down around four tenths of a percent as well. And actually all Asian markets, whether you look at a Kospi, Shanghai Straits, all of them also seeing a little bit of a pullback at the start of the trading session. The gift nifty will also come up for you. Of course, we saw a stellar rally yesterday, 200 points higher, but looks like we might see a little bit of a muted open. 25 points lower is where we're at on the gift nifty. So that's the shape of Asia right now. But let's uh, also kickstart the show by bringing you an exclusive voice all the way from Davos. 2023 turned out to be better than feared, while 2024 looks tumultuous. That's the word coming in from noted Professor Kenneth Rogoff. Speaking to Shireen, he adds that he is cautiously optimistic right now on India. Listen in. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is 2023 was better than I think most of us imagined. I, I wasn't one of those saying there'll absolutely be a recession, but it's surprising to have interest rates go up that much and not have that happen. Uh, so all you can say about 2024 is it probably is not going to be as good as 2023. And the, the volatilities around geopolitical events, uh, the still high interest rates, inflation hasn't come down, is, is still pretty considerable. But I have to be sobered by, look at 2023, which could have been a lot worse. Yeah, and it didn't turn out to be as bad as people were expecting to be. We didn't have the recession in the U.S., uh, even though, as, uh, as you point out, we had uh, record high interest rates. But on interest rates, you believe that even with inflation coming down, we're likely to see rates continue to be longer, uh, higher for longer? Well, I, I do believe that. I've been writing about this mm -hmm. really for a decade, that they fell off a cliff after the financial crisis. And people would come up with these after the fact rationales. Oh, you know, demographics, people are getting older. We're never inventing anything again. This is gonna be forever. It's summarized in my brilliant colleague, Larry Summers, Secular Stagnation. I never bought it. And my own academic work on this shows that we get these interest rate cycles, but they tend to go away after a time. So I think we're gonna be looking at interest rates that are more normal, mm. but not necessarily what people have gotten used to. So put a different way, inflation's coming down, interest rates will come down, but not as much. But let's talk about India uh, and the outlook for India. I mean, here the mood continues to be fairly bullish as far as India is concerned. What's your take? Well, I mean, I think part of the reason the mood's bullish on India is it's so negative on China. I agree with that. I mean, I think, I think when we spoke last year, I talked about that. Uh, and so India is sort of looking good by comparison, and the rate of growth is very good, but I mean, India still has a long ways to catch up, and it's doing, I think something's really well, like it's finally gotten it together on infra building infrastructure, mm -hmm. 
and catching up on that, which is low-hanging fruit in development. I mean, there's no reason for India not to have world-class infrastructure in order to be able to build out its economy. On the other hand, you know, you still have, uh, you know, some of the issues with way too much protectionism, uh, at least according to people who study it, a lot of monopolies really in India over concentration of power. But, you know, uh, clearly uh, India is very well represented at Davos here. Uh, the mood's bullish. I, you know, I would be cautiously optimistic because there are some of these longer term problems that if you're really going to catch up, all right, that is the word coming in from Ken Rogoff on the global economy, but also on India. With that, let's move on and talk about all of the cues that you should track as we get into this trading session. We have our team here to help you with the trade setup. Ekta or Maz are both with me now and join us for exactly that. Uh, guys, a very good morning to both of you. Ekta, take us through the cues that we should track because the momentum in this market seems solid. Hi, uh, Pavitra. Morning. Yes, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. It is the momentum which really continues for our market. So the markets did post that record close, which was led by even Reliance Industries, IT as well. And uh, the Nifty, you, you know, uh, conquered that 22,000 mark. In fact, it ended higher for the fifth consecutive session. The mid-cap index too posted what was a record close. FII's net bought around 1,085 odd crores in yesterday's trading session. So it is the first buy figure after four sessions of selling. DII's net sold around 820 odd crores. It was the first uh, sell figure after five consecutive sessions of buying when it came in from the DII's. Now the momentum from results, the inflation data, the pre-election rally, is all probably coming together, aiding market sentiment and allowing us to probably differentiate ourselves from the globe at this point in time. So maybe this buy on dips with a focus on stock selection, this kind of strategy is probably like likely to continue. Now, in terms of the global queues, the US markets were closed. Asia is largely lower at this point in time. There was some amount of trepidation on Brent crude prices as well. And the gift nifty is indicating a bit of a lower start. What really matters for, our now, for us uh, right now is probably how we're going to react to numbers. So we have a lot of results coming out, especially from the banking space. So that will be a key focus area for us. So for example, we have Federal Bank, HDFC Bank, uh, Bank of Maharashtra, which will be releasing numbers. Besides that, l and Tech, ICICI Securities, which will be a good one to watch out for, Goa Carbon and ICICI Lombard General Insurance. So we have a whole host of numbers to reckon with today. Okay, it's going to be a busy day. Ekta, thanks a lot for taking us through all of those cues. Let's talk about all of the stocks as well. Uh, Harmas, take us through the list of stocks. Of course, like Ekta was pointing out, all of the banks are going to be in focus ahead of the big HDFC bank uh, numbers later in the day. But take us through the action that's come through overnight. Absolutely, and HDFC Bank will be the one to watch out for today. But I'll start off with some earnings reactions. And Geo Financial Services came out with numbers yesterday. Total income, X of dividend income was at 413 crores compared to 390 crores in the previous quarter. The net profit, X of associates and joint ventures was at 227 crores, almost flat compared to 233 crores in the previous quarter. Angel One will react to numbers. Revenues were up 40%. Margins were down, though, slightly, almost 600 basis points. But they have had the highest ever client addition, up 16% quarter on quarter. and the equity and FNO market share both have gone up by almost 60 basis points each. Hindustan Copper and Nalco will be in focus because their joint venture has signed an agreement with Argentina for their first ever lithium mining project. And uh, this is a JV. They will, uh, as per the JV, will develop five lithium brine blocks in Argentina as per the agreement. Aster DM has said that they plan on giving away almost 70 to 80 percent of the initial sale proceeds as dividend to shareholders, which comes up to around 110 to 120 rupees per share. And the board meeting will be held in early March once the stake sale is complete. BLS International has announced a new acquisition. They'll announce uh, they'll acquire a 100% stake in iData, which is a Turkish-based company, for 50 million euros or nearly 450 crore rupees. DCX Systems has launched a QIP for 500 crore rupees. Uh, Zomato's block deal where Motilal Oswal mutual fund sold shares and uh, asset monetization where PNC Infratech will sell up to 12 SPVs for around 9,000 crore rupees. Back to you. All right, that is a lot, Ormas. Thanks a lot for filling us in with all of that action. Let's also talk about cues from the futures and options space. Nigel is here with exactly that. Nigel. Well, uh, you know, it's good because both the pillars of the market, Nifty Bank, the Nifty IT Index, as well as Reliance Industries, they have been firing, and that's what's helped the Nifty to end high. Yes, it was a good session. The last stick was, in fact, at the high point of the day, around 22,100-odd. 
What did the FIs do? They added 10,000 long positions. They covered 5,000 short con uh, contracts. So that's the swing factor of close to around 15,000 contracts. And keep in mind, now that FI net long position is the highest we've seen in absolute terms in 2024 so far. On the options side, there was aggressive writing, 22,000 put, 22,100 put, 22,050 put. Between them, they added more than a crore share. So it's telling you there was aggressive writing. And because of the kind of confidence the put writers have, now the PCR has moved around 1.5. Remember, this is the higher end of the range. Normally, 1.55, 1.6, we do see a bit of a cool-off factor. So keep that in mind. One is that the FIs are going very, very aggressive on the net long side. You have the PCR that's at the upper end. And on the day the Nifty moves up, you see the India VIX move up yet again because the IVs are moving up on put as well as on the call side. That's sometimes a word of caution that comes in there. Yes, the Nifty is in a bull grip and the uptrend is very much intact. But maybe in the near term, we could expect some kind of consolidation or maybe a couple of days where we see a pullback. You know, not, maybe not today, but the next few days going by these signs. The levels come up for you on the screen. Gift 50 suggests that we pull back close to around 25 points. The Nifty Financial Services Index plays out expiry today as well. Back to you. Okay, Nigel, thanks a lot for laying out all of those cues. With that, we do need to get into a short break on the show. But when we return, like we told you, HDFC Bank will be the first of the big banks to report its third quarter earnings today. So we're going to line up the expectations in just a bit. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast. As promised, let's talk about the big bank earning expected today. That is from HDFC Bank. We have Abhishek here with us to line up the key expectations this time around. Abhishek, stable quarter expected? Uh, well, yes, uh, stable quarter expected from SDFC Bank, uh, despite uh, one-offs that we are expected on the tax front. So, uh, to begin with, you know, advances growth has been pretty strong. CD ratio has improved for them on a sequential basis, which could augur well for the net interest margin, and that can remain stable on a sequential basis at 3.4%, uh, as per Nomura estimate, versus 3.4% that they reported in the previous quarter. Uh, Jeffrey's estimate slippages or formation of bad loans in a particular quarter to be around 6 6,300 crore. Morgan Stanley estimates at about 6,500 crore for the same. However, in the previous quarter, it was at 7,800 crore. So, decline in slippages is expected. Tax can impact the bottom line or the part for the company, given the fact that you know they have to make a uh, elevated tax provision this time for the merged uh, merger that they did uh, of SDFC Limited with themselves. So, credit cost to remain stable on account of the fact that slippages will decline. Asset quality largely gross NPA expected at and around 1.3%. Our poll is on a sequential basis. YOY is not comparable as, uh, you know, SDFC Limited got merged. So, NI is expected to be up 6.2% quarter on quarter, while profit can decline by 1.8% on a sequential basis. Back to you. Okay, Abhishek, thanks a lot for taking us through all of those estimates. That is the big number to watch today. But moving on to another important story, over 24 crore people in India have been alleviated from multidimensional poverty. This is in the last nine years. Um, as per a discussion paper by Niti Aayog, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and Madhya Pradesh have all registered the highest decline. The findings are not based on per capita income, but on social development goals. So Sapna is joining us now with the details on this. Sapna. Well, as per Niti Aayog's findings, there has been a sharp decline in the in multidimensional poverty levels in India. Now, what multidimensional poverty means is that, uh, you know, the criterion is not income-based. We are not talking of per capita income here, but uh, what Niti is talking about are, uh, you know, broad, globally accepted social development goals like health, education, standard of living. People are being assessed or their poverty levels are being assessed on these grounds and not on income levels. So, we need to be clear about that. So, keeping this in mind, there has been a very sharp decline in India's poverty levels. In 2005-2006, uh, uh, more than half of India's population was actually multidimensionally poor. That percentage has now come down to around 11.28%. Uh, in terms of numbers, some numbers over here. So, last nine years, what Niti is uh, trying to claim is that in the last nine years, this has helped India, or rather this has helped almost 25 crore Indians escape poverty. Going forward, uh, it's Neeti's view that government interventions have really helped uh, bring these numbers down. And going forward, some more schemes will be required just to make sure that this uh, decline or other steep decline in uh, multidimensional poverty in India continues.
All right, Sapna, thanks a lot for bringing us all of those details. In fact, let's also listen in to BVR Subramaniam, the CEO of Niti Aayog, talking about uh, the poverty levels in India and how they plan to really bring that down. Listen in. Think of what it means for the world in terms of people being lifted out of poverty globally, in terms of meeting SDG goals globally. So I think India's contribution is significant, number one. Number two, it also means having brought poverty down to this level and we just are at the cusp of going further down and reducing absolute poverty below less than 1%. And I think it's doable and in doable in less than a decade. And uh, with the kind of effort the government is putting in, we can actually achieve it. Okay, that is the word coming in from the Niti Aayog CEO. But let's now move on. And I also want to bring you some important updates from the aviation space because that has been uh, seeing some trouble over the past few days, particularly in the north, owing to bad weather and subsequent flight delays. So the DGCA has now issued a standard operating procedure with regard to flight cancellations due to long delays for weather-related uh, reasons, of course. The airline would have to publish real-time information regarding the delay on the airline's website. SMS or emails to all passengers also have to be sent out. And and display boards have to be stationed near airport gates. The DGC has also said that airline staff needs to suitably communicate with passengers regarding any delay. So uh, with this operating procedure in place, hopefully, uh, you know, the situation that we've been seeing across airports can improve. That is an important update. We'll get into a break on that note. But on the other side, we're going to shift focus, talk all about the world of commodities. We'll bring you that update with Manisha on the other side. Welcome back. Let's bring you some global updates now. And this is from the tensions that we're seeing in West Asia. The U.S. Central Command on Monday said that Yemen's Houthi rebels attacked a U.S.-owned and operated dry bulk ship with anti-ship ballistic missiles, although there were no reports of injuries or significant damage. This comes after the U.S. and British forces carried out dozens of air and sea strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen. In a separate development, Iran's Revolutionary Guard said that they attacked the espionage headquarters of Israel in Iraq's semi-autonomous Kurdistan region. In a statement, the IRGC said that they used ballistic missiles and named Israel's spy agency the Mossad. All right, so that is an important development that we are getting. But with that, let's also talk about all of the cues from the commodity space and what all of these developments have really meant for the commodities. Manisha is here with that update. Uh, Manisha, what kind of moves have we seen in commodities overnight? Well, uh, there is a certain jitteriness and the market seems to be accepting the fact that this could go on for some time. So what we are looking at is longer routes and fleet costs added to this. Uh, at this point in time, if you look at the commodity market, there also are individual factors at play. For the crude oil price, is essentially we did see 2% of gains in the previous week. We are still holding around that $80 per barrel mark for the Brent prices there. There is also growing oil production from the non-OPEC countries. That is keeping the prices in check. But otherwise, as you mentioned, the Houthi movement is expanding targets in Red Sea. More oil tankers are steering clear of the place. And the Libya protests also have threatened to shut two more oil and gas facilities there. Remember, we already have seen two facilities being shut in the previous week itself. So there are concerns now coming in for supplies, but how much longer can they go on is what will uh, tell you on what kind of premium the crude oil prices will see. In the meanwhile, the ferrous metals have seen a decline. Demand from the steel mills has dropped. The port inventories seem to be building up. China in the month of Feb will go for a gold, golden week holiday. And then this is also the winter uh, seasonal factor where the construction demand actually comes down. So you have iron ore prices trading at a six-week lows and steel trading at a two-month lows. Okay, Manisha, thanks a lot for bringing us that update in terms of what's really going on with the commodities. With that, we're going to wind down on this edition of Power Breakfast. Thank you all for tuning in. We have Bazaar Morning Call on the other side.